We as humans face a question. Will we colonize Mars? What does that mean? Colonization is a different word than merely visiting. We can visit Mars. We also can climb Mount Everest. But does anyone choose to live there? No. The only permanent inhabitants of Mount Everest are those that died in attempts to climb it. But at the same time, we have had a long-term presence in low Earth orbit through the International Space Station. We were able to do that by exporting Earth's environment into a sealed compartment. We will have to do this with Mars. There are people that will go there, and there are people that will come back. But anyone that wishes to stay for years faces any number of problems, some of which we haven't even thought of yet. Mars colonization will be hard and deadly, but there's a wild card here. We talk about terraforming Mars to become more like Earth, more hospitable to humans. But we can also alter ourselves to better suit Mars. But if we do that, the colonists would no longer qualify as human. They truly would be Martians. Welcome to Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. Today's episode, John is joined by George Dvorsky. A futurist, science fiction writer and bioethicist, he has written and spoken extensively about the impacts of cutting-edge science and technology. A founding member of the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, he is the chair of the board and program director of its Rights of Non-Human Persons program. George is a senior staff reporter at Gizmodo, where he writes about science, culture and futurism. Welcome everyone to Event Horizon with me, John Michael Godier. If you enjoy what you hear, fall into the Event Horizon, hit the like button, and become an active subscriber by ringing the bell. George Dvorsky, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks for having me. Now, George, you recently wrote an article on Gizmodo, I think. You do not believe humans will ever colonize Mars. Now, I want to make a distinction there. Visit Mars is one thing, colonize is another thing entirely. What's your position on that? Yeah, and I appreciate the the distinction because it's it's important. Like nowhere, you know, in the article do I ever dare to suggest that we're not going to go there. Like, I mean, of course we're going to go to Mars, you know, and and hopefully even within our own lifetime. And you know, there's some projections for the 2030s, 2040s, you know, uh, in and around that territory. And I think that's completely realistic. And yeah, I mean, we'll 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 land there. We'll even you know set up some bases, do some important science there. The distinction I make is, and it's an important one. The, the idea of colonization, where we have groups of individuals, large groups of individuals living on Mars for the long term. And because we're talking about colonies, by virtue of that, we're obviously talking about self-sustaining habitats, dwellings, communities, towns, whatever, that also would be not just self-sustaining, but self-perpetuating in the sense that you're going to see generations after generations. So clearly the model here is predicated in human history, which is we are a species in which we've been migrating ever since day one, really, moving from, from one location to another, setting up a location in new habitats, sometimes hostile habitats, yet finding ways, having the resilience to do so, and yet continuing to have families and generations and continuing to live on to live on and you and evolve. So that that's that's the same model, I suppose, that's being applied to the situation that's or the predicament even that's presented by Mars. By logical extension, we think, well, we're not going to keep, you know, this thrust of migration. We're gonna, it's not going to stop anytime soon. The logical extension of it is that we're going to go off world and become an interplanetary species. Mars is clearly the most viable planet that we know of in which we could do that. What I argued in the article, and there's actually two distinctions worth noting. One is, yeah, where I'm talking about colonies and not just going to Mars. And, but the second is I said humans will never colonize Mars. And I think that was lost on a lot of readers. As, as often frustrating the case for a writer is too many people write you nasty letters and then spout out angry tweets and you quickly realize they hadn't actually read the article. They look at the headline, they might even dare to look at the lead, but even in the, in the lead I made this clear that what I was suggesting is that if we modify ourselves, if we modify our biologies 
to the point where we're no longer human, then now we're, that's a different story. Now we're talking about post-humans or some transhumanistic kind of entity. That's that's maybe more plausible in terms of who might be able to colonize Mars. So I'm just going to restate that headline again. Humans will never colonize Mars. But that's not to suggest that post-humans or some other means of intelligence won't be able to, to colonize Mars as well. I think a lot of people don't really realize what that means. As we gain the ability to modify ourselves genetically and technologically, we become something else. We are no longer homo sapiens. We are some sort of next step. How far in time do you think we are from meaningfully doing that? It's, it'll be a while yet. And I mean, interestingly enough, not even necessarily because of the technological aspect of it. We could already today, using the genetic technologies that we already have at our disposal, and even some of the groundwork that's been done to date, we could use tools like the CRISPR-Cas9 editing system and other, other gene editing systems to already start to tweak away, you know, change those characteristics those genetic at the genetic level. For example, we know fundamentally that low gravity, and again, we can, over the course of this conversation, get into all the various, you know, deleterious aspects of living on Mars, but the, we're not talking microgravity, of course, but we are talking low gravity where, uh, like I said in the post, like if you're about a 180 pound man, um, you're gonna weigh only in about you know 70 pounds or so on Mars, which is about 68 pounds uh, on Mars, which is um, which could create some serious problems over the long term. But anyways, at, at a genetic level, if you're dealing with, let's say bone loss and muscle loss and all those other uh, effects of low gravity, well, why not create a, a genetically modified individual where they could actually that the genes are doing something different in terms of how the bones are being calcified or strengthened or how the, or how the muscles work because we all know that within the human the entire span of all humanity the range is quite significant like we think about some of the greatest athletes in the world we know there's differences between fast and slow twitched fibers and all those different aspects of physiology so you know we could tap into what those genetic mutations or tweaks that athletes have that we might want to actually even boost even even more so such that we could become more resilient in terms of our ability to live off world, particularly in a Martian environment. But further to what you were saying, which is, yeah, but at this point though, if you're starting to tweak to such a degree, and you're changing this and you're changing that, because we haven't even talked about things like cybernetics or even nanotechnology or even different kinds of ways of imbuing in information technology into what was a human or what used to be, I guess, something representative of the human species. We don't actually have the term to describe what that might be. So we, in the transhumanist community, we just say you'll be post-human, you know, as something that came after humans. In this case, though, you'd actually be a Martian, as far as I'm concerned. You'd probably come up with a like homo sapien Martian, you know, something like that. But the, but the fact of the matter is it won't be, it can't be your run-of-the-mill human unless this, unless human colonists, by strict definition, are ready to face all of the tremendous uh, health risks and psychological risks that would be presented by living in long-term colonies on Mars. One might say, because of a lack of oxidation, sending a conscious sentient machine to Mars to colonize it that's internally human. Maybe it was once human, but in reality, it's completely technological. Do you think that's the best route? Or do you think biology, you know, should we leave biology at the door when we go and colonize Mars? Yeah, I mean... I think I wouldn't go so far as to describe it as the best route. It certainly is an ideal route because we're now talking like obviously we see that the rovers are doing quite well on Mars in terms of just being these mechanical entities that are working there. Although they have their own problems, as we've seen from dust storms and other hazards that, again, Mars is not a very um, um, happy place in terms of uh, uh, living there. Whether you're man or machine, but yeah, I mean, um, oftentimes I think uh, sometimes you know, yeah, uh, bio, again, it depends on what the habitats would be and, uh, and the kinds of resources that would be available to the colonists. But I sometimes envision hybridized, you know, um, post humans in the sense that there is at least some retention of biology. I'm not necessarily advocating here for you know, this complete post biological being, although that is certainly a, a possibility. Because as we know, biological aspects are quite fragile and they degrade quite easily, in, in, in the, particularly in the context of radiation exposure. We're talking about the way it affects cells in our DNA. So yeah, we could maybe eliminate that as much as possible, or at least shield that post-human as much as possible from those effects. And I think we'll go far away. Uh, it'll, it'll go a long way toward creating the kind of organism that could actually uh, live on Mars. If we could even like backtrack a little bit here, just tweak my memory about something, even Another possibility, and this might sound a, lit, a bit not terribly exciting to your listeners, but 
we could also, you know, explore and live on Mars virtually. And I know that's kind of a halfway measure, but it's still something that's worth discussing. So let's say, you know, you send a robot to Mars on your behalf. That could be a rover. It could be a bipedal creature. It could be, you know, some kind of a spider-like animal, whatever, or even a, a flying, you know, entity um, with a camera, you know, or all the other kinds of instruments you'd ever, you'd ever want, but that you could live virtually through that robot, you know, living and doing what it needs to do on Mars. And at least that's kind of would give us the sense that we are there and that we're engaging, you know, on the red planet and having, you know, fulfilling some of the things that we'd like to be able to fill, including work, um, whether it be, you know, building things or, or, or setting stages for maybe the fu like future phases of, uh, of exploration of, 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 of Mars. And similarly, more radically now, there is the idea then of what you were suggesting earlier, which is something that's completely technological. Uh, where let's say you've uploaded your consciousness or somehow even duplicated your, you know, your, the con your conscious processes into a robot, you would then actually be physically embodied in that robot as you're working on the Martian surface and you'd be protected from, you know, all the, all the, all the ravages that the planet would uh, throw at you. And you could actually conceivably work on the surface as a result and not necessarily even need, you know, protection suits and all that sort of thing. But even back to a, a question that you asked earlier, which is, are we wanting to eliminate biology altogether? And again, not necessarily saying that's that's the case, because again, we can just redesign, you know, biological entities in such a way that uh, we can again keep some of that that th that those those biological vestiges, but radical redesign. So, you know, post humans that don't have lungs and find ways to breathe some other way, or dramatically, radically eliminate the need for sustenance and 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 water. Again, these are gonna, these are massive engineering problems. But uh, ones that we should consider if we actually want to have a sober conversation about how we're going to colonize Mars. Yet further back to the question, I think that started this whole thread was, you know, how far away in the future, you know, are we actually are we talking about? And I think that again, uh, there's going it's the it's the social, legal, ethical aspects of modifying ourselves that are the the greatest barriers to this this kind of progress. And I don't mean that in a in a disparaging, negative sort of a way. I am absolutely a cheerleader for regulations and clear-mindedness and safety and efficacy for all this. Um, I certainly don't want you know, want us to abuse these technologies and create these horrific, um, you know, organisms or uh, you know modify our, our our progeny and our, ourselves in certain ways that could really be tremendously damaging. Which is why we have to have this slow rate of progress. So already today, as I mentioned, we have the means within us to create genetically modified individuals and we have and unfortunately it's been done rather I guess illegally or certainly clandestinely and uh, many of your listeners might recall from last year there was a Chinese scientist who kind of went rogue a little bit and he created these uh, genetically modified twins yes. again he used the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing system and what he did was not only not only did he create the world's first genetically modified human babies he actually created the first genetically modified enhanced babies and what I mean by that is he actually modified them such that they had a built-in immunity to the HIV virus. And this was part of, part of the experiment. As the father in these experiments, all the fathers in these experiments um, were actually HIV AIDS positive. And um, so this was, in a way, they had – this is this, this genetic uh, mutation, by the way, it does happen in the general human population, but it's exceptionally minuscule in terms of its, you know, its, uh, how, its frequency. But this, this scientist actually deliberately gave it to them, and I, I would classify that as an enhancement because it's not something that's part of normal human functioning. And to me, it was – yeah, it was not it – was it was these were the first kind of like transhuman babies in a sense that they had this natural immunity to the uh, HIV virus. So I only bring this example up because it does show that, yeah, we're, we're going to do this. We're going to get there eventually. Mind you, you know, this man's going to be in jail for some time, I suspect, because he falsified ethics documents. He lied about the nature of the research. He didn't tell his team exactly what they were doing and didn't even tell the families completely what they were doing. And that's not how you do science, obviously. No, no. Um, so um, obviously, if we're going to do Mars, though. Um, we would have to be very overt about it and say, hey, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to, you know, we're trying to maybe, again, I'm not a huge advocate of uh, animal experimentation. Don't get me wrong. I hope, don't want anyone to get mad at me here because I have my own, that's another side issue altogether. But let's just say for the sake of argument, we can test it on animal models or computer models to show the efficacy of certain genetic modifications. Again, bone health, muscle health, 
again, we haven't described what 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 you know low gravity or radiation or all the other hazards on Mars does to our psychology and our brain health. You know, in terms of the gray matter development and the way the fluids flush up into our head in, in low gravity environments, like all these different things that we have to fix if we want to live uh, live there uh, long term. So yeah, let's maybe iteratively, methodically think about ways in which we want to actually literally create Martians out of out of the stock, the DNA stock that is Homo sapiens. I think that's a completely reasonable way to move forward. And mind you, you're going to have to get buy-in from from people on this. Uh, you're going to have to get, you know, uh, uh, for the reasons that I mentioned, is that you're going to have to j- justify this, uh, you know, ethically, um, legally, in terms of being able to, to actually create people that are built specifically to live on Mars and literally nowhere else. And that's going to be... <laughs> That I can't even imagine the you know the the kind of you know barriers and discussions and you know even to argue arguably you know the kind of social panic that it might even that might even happen as a result of those kinds of conversations. Yet to me, it's no more ridiculous than just the idea of just sending unmodified humans to Mars and having them exposed to all of the hazards that would be there and having again like I mentioned in the post, dram- I think dramatically reduced life. Uh, uh, lives, both in terms of lifespan and even in terms of the general enjoyment of their day-to-day living. One thing among many things that you said that piqued my interest is this idea of virtual colonization. Because if you're sending just probes there that people can virtually control and basically, for all intents and purposes, be on Mars while still be on, you know, living on Earth, that could be applicable to just about anywhere in the solar system. So you could set up a Europa colony, right? I mean, you could you could colonize anywhere, just uh, robotically and in virtual reality. And when you're tired of it, you just switch it off and you're, you're back to the world, so to speak. That seems to me way more viable than actually going to these places and setting up actual colonies, even genetically modifying people to even live there. It seems like a lot more work than just simply doing it virtually. Do you see that in the near future? Oh, I... Yes, uh, definitely. I, I love this idea. Uh, I mean, yeah, imagine, you know, the, exactly what you just said, the virtually anywhere in the solar system, therefore, uh, suddenly becomes accessible to an interpersonal experience, provided that we could obviously develop these technologies. And I can't see why we wouldn't be able to, you know, to have this kind of, you know, a POV perspective of the solar system would be remarkable. And uh, yeah, it would and it would preclude the need to actually get into a rocket ship and into a spacecraft and you know all that's all all of that that's entailed in terms of getting from point A to point B. And yet, you're ar- arguably you're still accomplishing the same thing, given that the that the robot in question or whatever it is that is doing the exploring is actually achieving what you're wanting it to achieve. So for me personally, you know, a flyby over you know uh, the uh, the oceans of you know Europa certainly would uh, would qualify. Or even, you know, visiting even uh, some of the, uh, you know, the um, the ice giants, you know, and, and their moons and uh, even just keep on going. You know, why not just send a, just something potentially interstellar, although life now we're getting into issues of human lifespan. But but your point is very well taken. And I, I and yes, this is something that we can already conceive of in terms of technologies that are either currently in existence or certainly will be in existence soon. So, uh, and uh, yeah, and I think it's just a more realistic way to engage even more people because Here's another issue is like, how are we going to get hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of people to start to become colonists in terms of the, of the sheer cost involved? And the other thing is not everybody can, can go into a spaceship and, and have what it takes to deal with launch and the, the demands of interplanetary space travel. I'm thinking particularly of, let's say, the elderly or somebody with or some or people with other health conditions and, and so on. It got me thinking, for example, the International Space Station via NASA have made certain modules of the space station available to uh, private entities and uh, for doing science work and other kind of exploratory work. But there was a very interesting caveat that caught my attention was that you have to, if you want to do this, you have to basically become an astronaut. You have to pass what is NASA's uh, list of stipulations in terms of your physical health, your training and all that in order for if you do want to work on the ISS in that private capacity. And there's a good reason for it because it's 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 not easy to sit into a rocket and you know be jettisoned off into space and even potentially have to deal with things like reentry and all that. These are not there's a reason why you know we admire astronauts as much as we do. They are quite superhero in terms of a lot of the things that they are able to accomplish. So my point being is that even the prospect of wanting to be a colonist is not that's not available to everybody. It'll only be to an elite group, whether because of wealth, of course, and that's a huge issue. 
Uh, but of course, in terms of their physical endowments and, you know, what, what, you know, prevent them from being able to, you know, go to Mars or even elsewhere, just even to space for that matter. So yeah, this idea of the virtual exploration, and again, I'm not, and I'm sure you agree with me, we're not, yeah. we're not talking about, you know, really just, you know, sending high res pictures back. We're actually talking about even, for example, the ability to have remote access to the robot and the way it's working. So you're actually us literally using your arms and your legs to move about in this environment. You actually have tact, even have the tactile feedback. The haptic feedback of picking up a boulder or, or you know, or touching, you know, uh, the ice that's in a crater, it actually manipulate the environment and experiencing it in a virtual sense. Then it, and, and you, at, at this point, you have to reasonably ask, well, what are you gaining by or losing by, you know, not actually being there in person in the flesh, so to speak? So, um, yeah, I think this is kind of a definitely a, something attainable and desirable. And the other thing is that it is it it, it affords it frees you from the chains of reality in a way because you could then say, well, I want to see what it's like to fly on Titan, like the quadcopter that's NASA's planning. You know, you can't just, if you're actually physically there, you can't just take off flying. But in a virtual world, you can see what that's like. So it may actually be better than physically being there. I think it's a fair point, definitely. And, and really, if you, if you want to complete the experience, you know, all you need is a rock from Mars, you know, that's about the only thing you don't, you don't get. <laughs> so there's probably a cottage industry of returning rocks from Mars maybe might form up. But fundamentally, it seems to me that, well, it would be virtually identical to being there. Yeah. So this, this virtual colonization, but this goes way, way further. There's much more you can do with virtual reality than just colonize. So when we come back, we'll cover that. I'm joined today by George Dvorsky. Now, George, we were talking about virtual reality and a lot of other things. Virtual reality offers us not only an option for exploring the solar system, but the entire universe. Essentially, you could simulate any environment you wanted and interact with aliens for all intents and purposes, virtual ones, without actually having to find them, which, you know, that evokes the Fermi paradox. When we look for them, we don't see them. But you could do it in virtual reality. So the, the lines between reality and unreality blur because you can start to imagine what an alien being might be like. You know, you could think about things like convergent evolution or you can think about things like building an alien from the ground up using genetic modification. It doesn't seem as important to answer the Fermi paradox at that point since you can build your own alien essentially. Do you foresee us ever doing anything like that, making something that isn't even related to humans? It's, it's a custom organism. I mean, it's a super interesting prospect that you raise because in a way it is a solution to the Fermi paradox, which is the reason why we're not encountering extraterrestrial intelligences is because we're all doing it. We're all kind of like we've all stayed home, so to speak, and we found a richer future, if you will, in inner space rather than outer space. If I could kind of coin a phrase from uh, my colleague, um, John Smart, he argues that space really is in, our re is in our rear view mirror and what's directly in our sights is this kind of uh, inner space environment where we would create, again, far richer, far uh, more dynamic, a far more meaningful existence by, you know, through things like uh, simulations and even through intelligence augmentation and just becoming this, you know, something perhaps a bit grander in terms of, you know, what, are, what human capabilities are currently. What, what that will necessitate, of course, will be, you know, supercomputers on the order of, you know, uh, astounding complexity and power. Because what you're suggesting is basically recreating processes of the cosmos to such a degree that the resolution of it would be accurate enough and rich enough that we'd actually want to explore those environments. So you're, for example, you're referring to convergent evolution. And I, I love that idea that, yeah, what would happen if you set up you know, the, some parameters that are exactly the way they are now and you know, on an Earth-like planet. And, you know, you can uh, speed up the uh, the simulation such that it's going to go through all the various phases of, you know, evolution and, you know, cataclysmic change and all those sorts of things. And then see what kind of maybe intelligent civilizations emerge from that. These kind of like alternate uh, simulations. I think the, the Oxford philosopher Nick Bostrom has speculated about stuff like this. Even, for example, simulating uh, human history, for example. So going back to, let's say, certain stages of human history and then restarting the clock to see how things would be differently, uh, would turn out differently given certain, you know, uh, certain changes and so on. And even, even potentially visiting, you know, engaging in these historical communities and societies. What we're talking about here are futuristic prospects of a very radical nature, obviously. And 
these are very hypothetical kinds of possibilities. I just need to point that out. Like the, the kind of supercomputer that would be required to do this is kind of ast astounding and beyond you know anything we'll have anytime soon. But it could be the kind of thing, again, the kind of thing that Bostrom has argued would be part and parcel of a you know a post-human, but also a you know a super a, a post super intelligence mode of being. So that that's um, that that just kind of needs to be you know prefaced a bit. Yeah, if you if we were to have this at our disposal, yeah, certainly it seems much more may it may pr prove more interesting for our, our descendants to want to engage in that. Like our even our like radically enhanced post-human descendants would rather do that than drift off into the unknown in vacuum of of space. And uh, certainly it seems like I mean it's certainly one potential solution to the Fermi paradox that that, that seems to be the mode because one of the ways of answering the Fermi paradox is you do have to find a solution that is. Uh, that can encompass all extraterrestrial civilizations and not just one or two. This has to be – the reason for it has to be all – again, all-encompassing such that everyone would fall into that that mode of being. And it's very difficult to you know pinpoint what that might be. But this one seems to satisfy a lot of those checkboxes in terms of what we might do in a given a post-human existence. Earlier we were talking about touching on ethics and whether we should do certain things. Superintelligence seems to me to be one of those. If you're going to create a super intelligent supercomputer, you probably need to step back and think on that for a long while before you actually do it, because the outcome may not be what you expect. Oh yeah, big time. This is one of my. Um, uh, this is an issue that I'm very passionate about. I've written quite a bit about it, and keep the kind of thing that even keeps me up at night uh, more than I would I would like it to. Obviously, science fiction has done a an okay job in terms of, you know, showing us the, 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 I guess the perils, if you will, of artificial superintelligence. But in another way, science fiction has also failed us tremendously in this regard. I also think that there's just a general naivete also just amongst the general population in terms of just how severe a disruption this would be. And when we're talking about artificial superintelligence or just even just uh, superintelligence in general, again, we're not talking about something that's really smart, like, you know, like, like, like 10 times an Einstein type thing. What we're talking about here is a thinking machine that is on the order of millions of times smarter and more capable than than what we consider, you know, the, the rate of uh, human cognition, for example. And it's not even, again, trying to quantify what we mean by smarter is often a difficult thing to do, but it's also important to acknowledge the speed and efficiency at which it would be able to uh, reach decisions and then act upon those decisions and then go about manipulating its environment accordingly. And what I'm getting at that is that when this is likely to happen, and it, this will happen very uh, in, in, at some point in the future when we're hitting that stage where we're creating an artificial general intelligence on the level of the human mind, that very shortly thereafter, it will then just rocket up to superhuman levels. Because even like an, uh, a, an artificial general intelligence that's equal to uh, a human brain, and then plus one is already super intelligent because it's now doing things, um, you know, at a level uh, much more um, proficiently than than we can do it. And uh, not to ramble on too much here, but we already have a lot of examples of super intelligence in our midst already. But very, it's so narrow focused as to not be even worth con consideration. Like I actually consider my calculator to be super intelligent because it can do math so much better than I can do it. But we also have more profound examples, like particularly in the gaming world, such as chess bots and bots that play Go and apparently now poker. Um, so because these are more real worldish kind of scenarios and they're performing at and literally the terminology being that's being used by the researchers here is that it's performing at a superhuman level uh, of intelligence. But as as these systems uh, lose that narrowness and as they get broader and broader and broader in terms of their scope and their reach and what how they can impact and influence on the world, then yeah, it'll take off really quickly. And before we know it, we'll have something in our midst that we can't even handle. We can't, we won't be able to understand it. It arguably won't even be able to uh, explain itself to us. And this is a big thing and it's called the black box problem in artificial intelligence, this issue of explainability or even the prospect of unexplainability. So yeah, this is a, it's a genuine uh, concern and it needs to, we should be all, we should all be very excited about it and not in a good way, agitated in terms of that kind of excitement in, in terms of the prospect. And we should be thinking about ways in which we can maybe hope to mitigate the problems and foresee, again, the issues that, that may arise and what we can maybe do to go about creating it as safely as possible. And it's, again, uh, um, that's a whole other prospect altogether in terms of how we might actually be able to do that. Now, one can think of all kinds of sci-fi scenarios that how that could turn out if we did create it. 
And one of those might be that it might decide that it wants to live in virtual reality and it simply never interacts with us. It just protects its power supply and that's all we ever hear from the thing. And it's just off simulating its own universe. Yeah. Which brings us into another area of Bostrom's work, actually, simulation theory. That this all could just be a simulation of such a computer that we live in. Do you put much stock into that idea? I think about it because it's, it's worth thinking about um, until we have a, a fundamental theory of the universe that's in a way complete, uh, which we don't. Uh, we're very close. I think we're, I, I, actually, I shouldn't say we're very close. I actually don't know. There's still a lot of unknowns. But until we think we know everything, we have to consider all possibilities, even kind of get a little bit metaphysical sometimes, because sometimes being philosophical and metaphysical can it can tease its way into actual science and and, and and raise hypotheses that are actually testable. So maybe there might come a day, you know, maybe 50, 100 years from now, where suddenly we can actually test Bostrom's theory and, you know, or, or maybe not. So, yeah, something to think about. I mean, his argument is a fascinating one. And of course, it raises concerns. One, I'm not con well, one a concern that some have that I don't have, and another concern that I am concerned about. If I might say it that way, but one concern that I don't share that is a concern is that it means our life is meaningless, or somehow, you know, it, uh, what's the point if you're living in in a simulation? Could be the opposite. Yeah, I mean, to, to me, my my life is as real as it. Again, if it's real, it's it's real, and. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter to me if I'm living in an analog universe or a digital universe. It's the fact is this is my life and I've got to navigate through this universe accordingly. Um, but it's interesting to say that some people actually panic about this prospect. Like, oh my God, my life therefore means nothing if I'm living in a computer simulation. Like, I don't know. and don't buy that argument. But anyways, but the one thing that does maybe cause upset is, okay, ultimately, if this is a simulation, then what the heck is the point of it? And also, what are maybe the potential bounds of it? And there's even some thought that maybe we'll reach a certain threshold, maybe of technological complexity or a, or a certain level of you know, cultural complexity, where it'll just be shut down by whomever is running it. And one idea, for example, that might be the point where we hit artificial superintelligence, because at that point, that might be the, that was the goal of it, um, to see how we would actually survive it or not survive it. Or ultimately, then the by the, by having to run a computer simulation that runs a superintelligence would be co would be computationally prohibitive. But even then, that doesn't that doesn't hold a whole lot of water because then you could just slow down the clock rate accordingly. But then that might pose other problems. So the point being is that yeah, there it, w it would be good to know the answer to this question because it could ultimately f <laughs> be predictive in the sense as to where we might actually be headed um, within the simulation itself. Again, this is. A lot of metaphysics uh, and speculation here. We're good with metaphysics and, and speculation. As long as we say that's what <laughs> we're doing. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. But I would say, though, interesting possibilities here is that it actually, such a simulation could actually lend meaning to life. Because at that point, if you're being simulated, say it's an ancestor simulation, and that it's humans of the future running a simulation to remember what it was like to be biological. You could tell yourself all kinds of stories like that, where you're, you're, the whole point of you being here is to experience biology. So there's the point, you know? So, so one could actually make the opposite argument and say that simulation theory actually could lend meaning to life. Yeah, I mean, um, it kind of like you get, you get these like crazy ideas as to what your life actually might be. And it could be, for example, a post-human is actually participating virtually through you, I suppose, as you're, that's what, hence the need for consciousness and conscious awareness. Otherwise, why would we, why would the simulation care to create conscious entities capable of suffering and joy and pleasure and despair and, and of course, having all the emotional, you know, urges that we have over the course of the day and, and goal-seeking creatures and all that. That's all part of what it is to be a conscious creature. Maybe that is further to what you were suggesting. Maybe that is something that, you know, our technological descendants might be doing just as either a scientific experiment or even as a form of entertainment, uh, as bizarre as that might sound, uh, you know, to live, you know, your life as like you suggested, what's it, what was it like to live as a biological human in the early 21st century, you know, and well, now you know, and the thing is, if you also live kind of like an indefinite lifespan, you could do this millions of times and you could experience millions, if not billions of lifespans, which, you know, again, kind of like, um, again, very science fiction-y, but uh, it would further to what you're suggesting, perhaps offer meaning in some way to, to your existence outside of what you think is the meaning of your own existence, which is kind of a bit of a mind trip there. It is. It is. It's interesting to think about. To shift gears back to Mars colonization, what is your opinion of the SpaceX plan to 
start going there at least, if not, depending on if anybody's going to want to find a colony. But it may just be Mount Everest climbers, people that just want to go there and come back. Do you think that's probably what's going to happen there? After this article was published at Gizmodo, I got a lot of people saying that I was doing nothing more than obstructing science and progress. And uh, I thought that was very unfair. It's not what I'm doing at all. I'm just, you know, sometimes we all need to have a little bit of cold ice water poured over us to kind of chill out the enthusiasm a little bit. You know, let's take stock as to, you know, how hard this is going to be and, and all the challenges that await. And and, and even to be to a certain degree, be skeptical about the claims that we see from entrepreneurs and, and multimillionaires and billionaires and as they kind of pitch these lofty ideas at us. And that's not to disparage at all what Elon Musk and SpaceX are doing. I'm, you know, um, I'm obviously they've done some remarkable things like, you know, watching these rockets, these reusable rockets, you know, land, you know, uh, in tandem together was, you know, so profound and so futuristic and amongst the other uh, uh, achievements. So there's no reason for me to doubt that they're serious about what they say when it comes to this plan, when it comes to how they think that they can go about colonizing Mars. And I wish them nothing but success. Um, mind you, buyer beware if you're going to start to buy tickets for this sort of stuff. J again, just be careful, you know, that you may never see your 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 purchase fulfilled. Um, mind you, if you want to invest in this stuff, that's all fine. We have investors, they take their own risks and that's all great too. But again, I wish them nothing but success and yeah, do it. You know, go to Mars, build, build, the, build the equipment, build the spacecraft, think it through, uh, you know, send a couple of explorers there, set up a base. You know, set things. You know, send things there in advance. You know, get it going. Yeah, hundred percent. I'm not trying to. You know, I'm not just because I'm saying. You know, that it's going to be exceptionally difficult, if not impossible, to colonize Mars. I'm not suggesting we shouldn't try. By bloody hell, we should be trying. It's kind of it freaks me out to think that this is currently the only place that we can live. You know, and and that needs to change. You know, we need to. We absolutely need to find ways of living off planet. Not not and not just because you know science fiction dreams tell us that or whatever. And and not even because the global warming crisis that we're having now and, and ideas that we're going to be making this planet uninhabitable. But that's maybe. I mean that that's reason for you know focusing on our problems here. I mean we. Why talk about making another planet habitable when we're in the process of making this planet uninhabitable? It just boggles my mind and it's extremely upsetting to have that kind of discourse. Yeah, let's let's get the process started such that we can eventually, possibly, hope to become an interplanetary species. Because, uh, again, we may face even greater risks here on, on this planet. It could be, whether that be in the form of a you know gigantic asteroid plunging into the Earth, something unforeseen, you know, even... Um, potentially risks from artificial superintelligence. We should probably not put all our eggs in, our, in one basket and we should do everything we can right now to think of ways of living you know, off planet as well. In addition to solving obviously the many uh, problems we have here, here on Earth. So yeah, go for it, SpaceX, go for it. anybody else. I, I wish you nothing but uh, best of luck in your endeavors. I, that's one of the things that I like about Jeff Bezos' plan is that he envisions basically all of the manufacturing base and everything moving out into O'Neill cylinders and things like that, which would make Earth a nature preserve, essentially, just populated by those that want to be here. Right. Um, I found that interesting, but probably pretty far off in the future. So we definitely need to solve our problems here as well as explore space. Oh, I think so. So would you alter yourself to live on Mars? Do you want to be a human or a Martian? As humanity explores the science of genetics and manipulating genetics, we will have to ask ourselves questions like that. But imagine being a human, or a former one, tailored to live on Mars. You might even become someone that can't even visit Earth, even though your origins are there. May you live in interesting times indeed. John, there's a man at the door. I already mowed the lawn. Oh no, he's got the old hey. car with him. Hey, hey you. We can't get this person out the car. Hey, hey you, we can't get this possum out this car. He just keeps snapping at me. He's chewing on the leather. He ate the gear shift lever. He's just going to keep snapping at me. He's going to snap at you. Flailing his gums. Give me the stink eye. That's, that's what he does. So you can keep this possum car. You turkey. I don't need no possum car. Possum don't require it. Oh yeah. Sweet, sweet Corinthian leather. I missed this so much. Wait, there's a scratch on the paint. What? 